I just want to spend a few moments now looking at that moment of embrace between Joseph and his brothers and his brothers in general, but between Joseph and Yehuda in specific, because this is a moment of the deepest recognition and the deepest healing in which we can see how this same conflict will resolve itself in the future, right? We can see how this moment foreshadows messianic times, how this moment sheds light on what we're even going through right now. And this is a source of serious discussion among uh, a lot of us, a lot of, among a lot of rabbis here in Judea, how this is all playing out right now. Uh, even though I have to admit that personally, I don't fully understand it yet. I can't see all the parallels. I know there are a lot of people who say that they do, and maybe they're right, but I don't fully get it all yet. And, and I'm not sure that we're supposed to fully get it yet, right? We're not supposed to peek behind the mask. We're not supposed to know it's Joseph before we're supposed to know it's Joseph, right? It's almost like we're in a time where the masks are starting to come off, but we can't see the identities yet. But the discerning eye, I'm sure we can all feel it. We can tell that the masks are coming off. Something is happening now. Okay, so this clash between Yosef and Yehuda, this tension, it's not just sibling rivalry. It goes so much deeper than that. It cuts to the core of, of two facets of the Jewish mission in the world, right? Jewish nationalism and, uh, and the, the particular, the Jewish particularism of Judah and this sort of cosmopolitan globalism of Joseph. I hope that makes sense to you. I'll try to explain a little bit more. But, 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 but even beyond those identities, it also just does go back to the very beginning in the simplest way, to the jealousy and the tension between Rachel and Leah, which carried over to their children and to all of their descendants. Now, we're going to get into a lot of Tanakh here, so I hope that, that you're with me. So we can see this tension, uh, even today, by the way, in Israel, playing out between the Jews of Judea, right, my kin out here in these mountains who are just so fiercely Jewish. You've seen them, you've met them maybe just virtually. Um, they, they speak and act and dress and behave differently than the rest of the world. They're just so authentically and indigenously Judean. They, 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 they highlight those differences between them and the world and they embrace them, right, with pride and with strength. And, and that's in contrast to the Jews of Tel Aviv, right? The Joseph Jews who engage internationally with technological innovations and startups and, and globalism. But that's only today, how it's manifesting today. And some people would agree or disagree with that assessment. But one thing that everyone would agree about is that this tension does weave itself throughout all of Jewish history. And that there's so many examples and manifestations that it's difficult to know where to start. But for me, I'll share with you the verse that really stands out in my mind. That, that I remember, which was um, after the destruction of Shechem, right, just a few parses ago by Shimon and Levi. We've discussed it at length in the past, and, uh, and when I read it, it really stayed with me. So remember, Dina was raped, and the prince wants to marry her, and Shimon and Levi lead them to believe that, that if they circumcised themselves and converted, that they could become one with the nation of Israel. But they really just took advantage of their post-circumcision weakness and they destroyed and wiped out the entire city. And Yaakov was upset about this and feared the response of the surrounding nations, to which Shimon and Levi responded, should he treat our sister like a harlot? It was an, it was an issue of principle for them, right? And, and to them, the consequences and the practicalities didn't matter. But what stood out so strongly is that they did not say, should he treat your daughter Yaakov, should, they, should he treat your daughter, father, like a harlot? No, it was more cutting than that. Dina was their sister, right? The daughter of Leah. And they felt that she was much more of their sister than she was of Yaakov's daughter. You can feel the pain there. They felt, they felt second tier their whole lives. They felt unloved. And this was a deep source of pain throughout the whole journey for them. And of course, uh, it culminated in the sale of Joseph into slavery. And you can actually see where it carries over, right? That moment where it carries over intergenerationally and in a real way with Reuven, with Reuben, right? The firstborn. So after Rachel died, the children of Leah expected 
Jacob to move the default location of his bed to their mother Leah's tent. But instead he moved it to Rachel's maidservant's tent, right? To Bilhah's tent. Reuben in specific, the firstborn, he was so deeply hurt by what he perceived as this terrible affront to his mother's honor that he went in and he moved his father's bed into his mother Leah's tent. And this was just such an overstepping of the boundaries that the Torah actually phrases it as if he had actually laid with Bilhah, which he literally did not do. All of the rabbinical Judaism, all of our rabbis agree that that did not actually happen, but that's what it was likened to. That was the degree of trespass there. And, uh, and, and for this act of rash impetuousness, he loses his firstborn status, right? There, there's different facets of the firstborn status, which are transferred to three of the other brothers, right? The priesthood goes to Levi, the kingship goes to Judah, and the birthright and the double portion it entails goes to Joseph, right? In the form of both of his sons, Manasseh and Ephraim being considered independent tribes of Israel and receiving two territories worth of land. The Lubavitcher Rebbe goes into this whole thing. He actually lays it out in detail, which we won't go into because of time constraints. But just skip ahead, right, to the end of the Egyptian exile and that tension, it continues, right? There's Moshe and Aaron who are like messianic figures. Moses and Aaron, right, the leaders of Israel, they're Levites, the children of Leah. So they're leading, the children of Leah are leading. But then Joshua, who actually conquered the land, he was from Ephraim, right? He was a descendant of Rachel. And it continues to the judges of Israel all the way to the first king. Now, Saul is the descendant of who? Right? Saul, Ben Kish, Ishiamini, he was the descendant of Benjamin, the son of Rachel. And he loses the kingship for his weakness and his disobedience regarding killing the Amalekite king Agag and his refusal to take ownership and responsibility for the mistake, which is a quality that his successor, a descendant of Judah, King David, does possess. And here, just allow me to open up a parenthesis. I just had to share this with you. Because here we see this brief moment of healing and heartwarming beauty in what is otherwise this ongoing rivalry throughout all of Jewish history. That And this moment, this beautiful moment, takes place between Jonathan, Saul's son, who is next in line for the kingship, and David, who is going to be the next king, and who is threatening to take his place and his power and his position and his authority. Now, uh, Rabbi David Foreman, I don't know if you know if you know, but he teaches on this in, in great detail and uh, how this how this whole relationship played out. And he points out the connection between Judah's recognition that his father's soul was kashur, right, intertwined with the soul of Benjamin and the same words right, were with Jonathan and David, right? Why was that so difficult for Judah to say that his father Jacob was intertwined with the soul of Benjamin? Because implicitly, he was admitting that he was less loved than Benjamin, that his father was more afraid of Benjamin not returning than he not returning. But now he mans up, right? He selflessly comes to terms with that truth, and he offers to take Benjamin's place of lifelong, of lifelong servitude, regardless of that jealousy. And so just as Judah selflessly offered himself up, in some ways even more beautifully, King Saul's son, Jonathan, descendant of Rachel, loves David so selflessly with all of his heart, and he offers to willingly sacrifice everything for him. And it's almost as if, like, Hashem didn't want, want to make sure we wouldn't miss this reference. The whole incident is encapsulated when Jonathan removes his cloak and gives it to David. That's right. Now think about it. Generations before, Judah violently ripped the cloak from Joseph and in, in blood and in tears and in jealousy. And now Joseph's descendant is voluntarily and lovingly removing his own cloak and giving it to the descendant of Judah. Then it was right, it was taken with force and jealousy then, and now it's given with love and selflessness. It was just such a beautiful healing. 
but then it goes right back in. Only two generations later, this rift opens up again when Solomon's son, Rechavam, foolishly takes the advice of his friends over his father's advisors, and he raises taxes, and the northern tribes break off to their own kingdom that's led by Yerovam ben Nevat, who is, that's right, what tribe is he from? A descendant of Joseph. I really wanted to go throughout all of Jewish history, but we'd be here all night. The, this division leads ultimately to exile and to the destruction of the temple. That is how devastating the consequences of this sibling rivalry can be. How horrible are the fruits of the jealousy over Yaakov's love. Really, it's, it's enough to make you just want to marry one woman and avoid this whole thing. But, uh, but anyway, as destructive as the rivalry is between the children of Leah and the children of Rachel, it is their reconciliation that will bring about peace, not only for Israel, but for the entire world. As we see in the prophecy in the book of Yechezkel, which is the Haftor of this portion, which with, uh, with your blessing, I sort of want to read in its entirety, even though it's going to take us over time. Is that okay? Give me a yes if that's okay. It's just such a powerful Haftorah. Okay. The word of Hashem came to me saying, this is what Yechezkel is saying. Now you, son of man, take yourself one wooden tablet and write upon it for Judah and the children of Israel, his comrades. And take another wooden tablet and write upon it for Joseph, the wooden tablet of Ephraim and all the children of Israel, his comrades. And bring close to yourself, one to the other, like a single wooden tablet, and they shall become one in your hand. Now when the children of your people say to you, will you not tell us what these are to you? Speak to them. Thus says Hashem, the Lord Hashem Elohim, behold, I will, I take the wooden tablet of Joseph, which is in Ephraim's hand, and the tribes of Israel, his comrades, and shall place them with it together with the wooden tablet of Judah, and I will make them one wooden tablet, and they shall become one in my hand. And the wooden tablets upon which you write shall be in your hand, in their sight they shall be one. Then speak to them. Thus says the Lord Hashem Elohim, behold, I take the children of Israel from among the nations to which they went, and I shall gather them from around, and I shall bring them to their soil. I shall make them into a single nation in the land upon Israel's hills, and a single king shall be for them as king, and they shall no longer be two nations, no longer divided into two kingdoms again. They will no longer be contaminated with their idols and their abhorrent things and their rebellious sins. And I shall save them from their habitations in which they sinned. And I shall purify them. And they shall be for a people unto me. And I will be for a God unto them. My servant David will be king over them. And there will be a single shepherd for all of them. They will go in my ordinances and they will observe my decrees and perform them. They will dwell on the land that I gave my servant Jacob within which your forefathers dwelt and they shall dwell upon it. They, their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David will be a prince, a nasi for them. I shall seal a covenant of peace with them, an eternal covenant shall be with them, and I shall emplace them, and I shall increase them, and I shall place my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place shall be upon them, and I shall be for a God unto them, and they shall be for a people unto me. Then the nation shall know that I am Hashem who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is among them forever. You see why I had to read that. I just feel like in the times that we're living right now, we need to read that. We need to see how this is all going to play out. The beauty and the light and the love and the spirituality and the godliness that's going to come to the world. And as we see the prophet Yechezkel say, it's only when both Judah and Joseph are brought together that the exiles will be ingathered and redemption will come. And he actually takes two sticks and, and act in the physical world and brings them together to ensure that his prophecy will manifest itself in the physical realm. That's why he does it in the physical world. Joseph and Judah will come together, Yechezkel is saying, and the, the exiles will be ingathered and redemption will come. As the masks are coming off and much of the world is turning not only against Israel, but yes, against the Jewish people. If you feel different, if your love for Israel is growing deeper and stronger, if you're thirsting to cleave to the nation of Israel and to the God of Israel, if you're thirsting to learn authentic Torah 
from Jews in Judea, then the land of Israel fellowship is for you. Hundreds of individuals and families from around the world come together on Zoom every week in what can only be described as a fellowship of love, friendship, of learning and praying and belonging. A fellowship really unlike any other. It's more than just a movement, it's a family. To learn more about the Land of Israel Fellowship, click on www.thelandofisrael.com backslash fellowship or send an email to fellowship at thelandofisrael.com. Love and blessings from Judea.